afternoon, afternoon everyone. everyone. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm Anthony, Anthony Firth, Firth uh, from uh, Fjord Limited. Limited. I um, used, used to do quite a lot of directly marine development led work, work less so now, but, but, um, and, um, but still hopefully make some useful observations uh, here. Yeah. So, so the question here, are we, are we, are we making, making the most, most uh, of uh, the marine, marine development, development uh, dividend? dividend? Um, First of all, slight like apology. I am mainly going, going to talk about England uh, rather than Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, but I hope the, uh, uh, the generalities uh, apply. Uh, it gets very complicated talking about four completely, I think, largely separate systems uh, in one go at all throughout. So I am going to talk more about uh, England, so I apologise on the hand. Uh, it's not quite accidental, accidental uh, uh, as I apologise I think it is, in, in an English context, uh, a good time uh, to talk about this. I'm, uh, uh, we'll just have the, the DCMS is tailored review uh, just about to happen in the next couple of weeks. Um, still, I think for the 9th of May, there are opportunities to submit comments to DCMS on uh, how uh, heritage is managed, in effect. Uh, by, 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 by historic England, England. so I think that's, that's a, there's an opportunity there for people, people to um, take their thoughts away and, and, and feed them into a process, process which is, is actually quite significant. significant. My understanding also is that historic England is going to be reviewing its own delivery of marine services as it comes out of its main phase of its change program. So, so, it's, so it's, it's a good time uh, in, in that English context to be uh, taking a um, a, a careful, careful look, look at, at how uh, marine, marine development-led development archaeology uh, operates. So, uh, previously, uh, I've likened um, how development-led archaeology in the marine sphere works to, a, uh, to uh, an engine. An awful lot of resources get put in, an awful lot of movement happens, but the question is, is that engine just kind of vibrating on the spot? Not actually going anywhere, or is it actually taking us into some uh, new places, interesting places? Is it an engine, or is it, is it a hamster wheel, uh, which it might feel like uh, uh, sometime? So I, I very much feel it should be an engine that's taking us in some uh, interesting archaeological directions, but uh, I don't think that's uh, necessarily inevitable. In terms of history, as far as I'm aware, the earliest development of marine archaeology took place in the mid-90s mid uh, with um, wastewater treatment works that were being planned in and around uh, Dover and Folkestone which had outfalls and elements of them and at that point um, from what I recall Hampshire and White Trust were commissioned by Wessex Archaeology to feed in a, uh, a death space assessment looking specifically at the marine uh, aspects of, uh, of that um, that, that development, it was a development covering land and sea, very big uh, wastewater, uh, rearrangement of the wastewater facilities in, in, in Dover and Folkestone. As far as I'm aware, that's the first one in, in England. I think there might have been some earlier work in, in Northern Ireland, but so if anyone wants to chip in uh, their claim for the earliest piece of marine development they work, then please do so. Um, the, uh, another very, well, a lot of the early pieces, um, Clavelli Bay Marine, you can see the technology that we're employing there. Uh, is um, not necessarily terribly high tech. Um, this is just looking at the, um, in fact, developing a deposit model in a, a marina that was going to be uh, uh, dredged, uh, increase the depth there. And it's just along the coast from the um, Iron Age site at Mount Batten in Plymouth. So there's, a, there's an interest as to whether there might be some uh, uh, Iron Age deposits in, in an area that was going to be. Uh, 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 we were simply going down and taking some uh, kind of gouge cores uh, through, the, through the base of the existing marina there. But things have moved on uh, in terms of some technology. Um, and I think it's also important to bear in mind that uh, marine development led archaeology has, has, has developed significantly, but not in isolation. There's a whole series of other things which should be going on. Again, very positive things uh, uh, are going on. Oops, sorry. Um, in the regulatory field, so um, Vickles already mentioned the um, 
the Dr. Dr. Uchul Dani in the contract. contract. That, that's, that's, that's field work and uh, archaeology really to support the, the regulatory process. And that's gone on and has been a constant uh, theme uh, throughout the same period. And there's, there's interactions there uh, between, between what's happening in there. Uh, development-led uh, archaeology and uh, marine archaeology for, for other purposes. Um, there's research-led marine archaeology, again, an awful lot of that's been uh, going on in the meantime. Uh, in the industry sector, you mentioned the ALSF uh, earlier on. So that's, in a sense, it's development-led, but it wasn't a very direct connection to specific schemes. It was coming more out of the industry as a whole, and we've seen that in other aspects of the aggregate industry and, to some extent, the offshore wind industry, where they've, as, as a sector... Uh, moved to make things happen rather than leaving it to specific um, applications. Um, community marine archaeology, I think particularly in the last uh, five, six, seven years, that's become a, a, an increasingly important uh, area of work. Quite a lot of money coming in into some projects from the um, National Heritage Lottery Fund and so on. Um, into tidal archaeology, almost just in some respects separate, but uh, some very important interactions between uh, intertidal archaeology and how that's grown and, and how uh, development-led archaeology is uh, growing too. Uh, and, and also um, development-led archaeology on land, we shouldn't forget that there's an articulation between how we think about uh, dealing with archaeology and the development process on land, what to take from that uh, in, the, in the marine. Certainly that has been the case, uh, as, uh, I think particularly in some of the uh, use of the geotechnical uh, approaches um, in kind of floodplain areas on land. There's a very close relationship between uh, the approaches adopted offshore uh, uh, and what was being is still being done onshore. So it's not not uh, shouldn't be seen in the bubble. An awful lot of roles and sectors. Again, Vic just touched on this. Different. People playing different roles, and organisations playing different roles. But the thing that I would like to stress here is that um, most organisations play several of these roles. Uh, you, know, the, you, you have a mixing uh, of these roles, they're not uh, discrete entities, there's a, there's a mix going on. I think, again, that's uh, an important thing to, to bear in mind. We've got universities that act as contractors, we've got contractors who do community archaeology, we've got museum archaeologists. Uh, who, who have uh, various roles too. So there, there, there is a, a you know a mixing uh, of those roles. We're not talking about um, sort of armed camps which never uh, deal with each other, except in a, um, you know these kind of uh, contractual relations. Right, brief history. So we heard mainly about wind farms uh, this this morning. Um, the some of the earliest work that was done was in actually was in the wastewater sector, so outfalls and so on. Not so much that was very much linked to water quality issues at the time. I don't know that there's so much of that happening now. There's a big phase of uh, capital uh, works in the uh, mid to late 90s, which, which invoked certain amounts of development labor work. Marine aggregates from around about 96, 97, uh, um, and has been a, a, an important uh, thread uh, throughout. Obviously, the wind farms coming in around about 2001, 2002, uh, and, and expanding very, very considerably uh, in, in, in the later rounds of here about round four this, this morning too. Ports and marinas and capital dredging again, they've been there. They're a, an important sector, very different in character to a, a big just hinting at this, very different in character to the quite often collaborative and forward-looking approach that you get in marine aggregates and offshore wind uh, with respect to archaeology there. Um, they need much more persuading um, to, to, to do anything, really, has been my experience. Um, telecom cables, electricity interconnectors, um, very much uh, part of the mix. Uh, wave and tidal stream energy, there are there been a few projects to demonstrate sites uh, and tidal, tidal lagoons uh, in, in, the, in the background too with for Swansea, which is, seems to be pretty stalled now, but that's still a, uh, a, um, a sector that could really uh, develop at, at, at some point. So it's a history, but it's also quite a lot of different types, different ways in uh, to dealing with marine uh, cosmic prompts to marine development and how uh, archaeology can fit in those. 
So, so if, if anyone feels, feels like writing the definitive history, uh, I'd be really happy to cite it. Uh, otherwise, it's just me scratching my head and trying to remember what happened. Right, uh, what dividend? What is a dividend? I have used the term dividend. So in terrestrial archaeology, it was very clearly a dividend uh, from, from rescue, as you see, this is the uh, uh, spend uh, on, on archaeology. Uh, really picking up, particularly through the 70s, uh, this, um, this is from the this past imperfect. And that dividend, it, in a sense, was it just the sheer quantity of work uh, being carried out and generating resources uh, and so on. We can see that dividend in different ways. We, we could look at it, probably do a similar map, uh, a similar chart to this for development of archaeology in the marine sphere, uh, looking at turnover on uh, um, development of projects. Um, you know, we might lean on a few people to extract that kind of information. I don't know that that information has ever been brought out before, but you know, in principle, should that should be there. Um, in a sense, anecdotal still, but quite a good gauge is is just the level of employment in uh, in marine archaeology. Vic said, I think you said, eighty nines, but actually no one actually employed. Uh, in, uh, in marine archaeology, there were a few, but not very, no, 86, what are we saying? I can't remember what year you used. Yeah, so very few. So if I take the baseline as being around about 95, 1995, the, the earliest uh, marine-led archaeology, development-led archaeology, I think there was about a dozen people employed in marine archaeology across the board then. And that was in itself, pro no, no, I think, eight, 16. That itself is a doubling since 92 because of a whole series of things that happened around about 1992 uh, in terms of the Royal Commission in England taking on staff and so on. So there was the NAS actually having paid staff and so on. Um, so you, there was probably a doubling between 92 uh, 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 and 95, 96 to about 18 staff. Now, there are far more people employed in uh, marine archaeology now in a, a whole range of roles that's got to at least doubled or trebled, probably more than that. Um, uh, so that's one way we could look at, uh, at that dividend. And thinking about some of the conversations that were happening at the EGM, that, that's not a, a negligible dividend. The fact that there are jobs for people, that this can be a, uh, can be a profession. And more important, like I said, employment and careers, that you can have a career in marine archaeology, uh, just was not the case in the early 90s. So the, the, the idea that there's a prospect of you could develop a career in this field with a reasonable expectation of you know, finding work and staying in work was just not something that existed uh, not long ago. I think that's quite a, quite a dividend. The skills and technologies that we're able to deploy, again, massive dividend. Inconceivable what we're able to do now in the marine field compared to uh, what might have been in our, even our hopes in the uh, early 90s. And that, that's a, a, a lot to do with development of archaeology, man, that, that's come in terms of the, um, uh, a lot because of the technologies that have been developing in that sector, but we've been able to make use of them very quickly. Uh, and that's a, a tremendous, whether it's a uh, multi-beam, various resolutions of geophysics, um, the the positioning that goes with it, the that access to, to geotechnical uh, um, um, coring and the analyses that go with that. I don't think anyone's really thinking that we could do that or even dream of doing those kinds of things uh, in 1992, 1993, 1994, that kind of period. So huge dividend uh, in terms of capability. I literally, I, I early, aggregates jobs. It was, in fact, dividend ports. We were looking at rolls of paper for the side scan and kind of squinting it. Um, you know, if you think of what we're now able to do and those kind of landscape reconstructions and so on, just not even dreaming of that kind of thing. And the discoveries and new knowledge that have come with that. There has been a whole series of discoveries uh, arising out of the development of archaeology and purely out of the development of archaeology. That wouldn't, wouldn't have occurred in a while. So that's a, a real uh, uh, premium too, and we've heard uh, some of uh, that also about the volumes of data. But th there is definitely have been discoveries and new knowledge uh, uh, arising out of uh, development uh, archaeology at, at sea. Definitely dividend. 
positive picture overall, but I want to crack into that a little bit. So the way that I'm going to do that is, so the, to me, marine archaeology always has uh, three objectives. It doesn't matter what, whether you're in a research context or a development-led context or, or community archaeology-led context, always three elements uh, to uh, uh, marine archaeology. We have um, a role in conserving the physical remains of the past, uh, a role in better understanding the past, uh, and uh, a role in enabling the public to appreciate the past. And those three are always present in different um, uh, different values to them, uh, 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 different proportions, but they're all always, always present. So th there's going to be some there's conservation, research, public engagement, they're all always present. And so they're present in uh, development led archaeology too, or should be. And those act, as I say, three things together, they're always there, always acting in combination. So I think that gives us a bit of a matrix through which we can look at how the, at the, the leg, the, the legacy, the dividend, how we're, how we're managing that, how we're coping with that. So to start off with um, conservation, uh, the, uh, how, how successful are we being in uh, conserving the physical remains of the past through the development uh, process? And uh, so I'd split this, you know, strength, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. So strengths, avoidance, we are avoiding things. Um, that's, uh, in a sense, we'll be able to conserve uh, a series of sites yeah, in situ, some of them really significant. So uh, the London, which got mentioned, the London, London Gateway Scheme, the London, the original proposal was for the channel to go through that site. The, the plan was to just, you know, that site would be destroyed. Um, so that one, they, they moved the channel. Uh, the site uh, uh, was uh, uh, kind of preserved in situ. Um, Swash Channel. Uh, Again, another really significant wreck that might have been uh, uh, impacted uh, if it wasn't for development led archaeology. Uh, Area 240, the Paleolithic material uh, that was recovered in such quantities, that was uh, protected with a uh, uh, exclusion zone around it uh, and so on. There's various other. Uh, ex situ uh, Prince's Channel wreck, for example, that was lifted in in large segments uh, out of the way of the, uh, uh, of the dredging program that was being proposed. Weaknesses, the responsibility for subsequent management. We have not dealt with that well. Even, so sites like the London, we've got an ongoing issue with uh, uh, that, that site is needing continuous intervention as material is uh, becoming exposed. Swash Channel hasn't had, I don't think, beyond its initial work, much in the way of, uh, you know, it's very close to the channel. It's, it's still a, 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 a risk from changes to sedimentation and so on. So. That responsibility for subsequent management, I don't think we've handled well. I don't think it has been handled well. The threat there is in situ deterioration post-construction. So basically, we save it during the construction, but thereafter, um, uh, there's no, no provision really made. The answer, the opportunity really, is, is, is through the, the, the uh, consenting process placing conditions on monitoring and post-construction actions. So building in exactly the same way as schemes have to cover the post-construction impacts or potential impacts on, uh, on wildlife, on birds, all sorts on uh, um, coastal processes and so on. There's an expectation of developers that if their scheme causes uh, a, a subsequent problem, that they will be drawn back in to remedying that problem. That doesn't really happen or hasn't really happened, I don't think, in, in uh, marine archaeology. I don't think there's any reason why it shouldn't. Um, conservation of the material archive. Again, I don't think that has been as strong uh, as it could be. We have had instances uh, of uh, um, the material archives from some of these sites being uh, properly uh, uh, conserved and, and taken in to the, um, uh, into conservation, into archiving. Um, not necessarily at the cost of the developer, though. You know, this, this would normally be the expectation of the developer. Uh, we've seen Historic England having to uh, take, take this on board in some instances. Um, so that, again, probably uh, compared to a terrestrial situation, not, not, uh, not, a, not a win overall. The danger being the material archive gets in limbo. 
And we know that that's happening on land a lot, but it's also happening uh, in the marine sphere with the added complications of uh, marine, marine material not being terribly uh, stable uh, if they're left to its own devices. The opportunity, the, the, the remedies to the archives crisis must think of as marine. So the archives crisis is uh, applying throughout terrestrial archaeology. archaeology. Marine is part of that problem, and the solutions that are adopted in, in the uh, and the terrestrial sphere must also be made applicable. There's no reason for not making them applicable in the marine sphere. So that's really, really important. We, we, shouldn't, we, don't, we don't think the marine archive uh, is being considered as part of that crisis in the way that it should be. Um, um, unknowns. So we're really good at avoiding things we don't know what they are. Um, that's the main method of mitigating for uh, anomalies, anomalies. Things that we think there's something there on the seabed, we don't know what it is. The cheapest thing to do is to avoid it. Now, which is good in a sense because it's very precautionary uh, and you can conserve it. Whatever that material that is proved to be, it's been uh, uh, conserved in a sense that it won't be damaged because it's been avoided. The weakness is really the lack of examination of those unknowns. And they're, they're not being looked at, at so we don't know what they are. Uh, but the consequence of that is we don't understand the character, the importance, uh, potential impacts of these anomalies which are being found in their hundreds, even on single schemes. They're being protected by exclusion zones, but again, they're not. That doesn't, doesn't do us any good archaeologically, and it doesn't do the development good in, in the long term, because that approach is probably overly cautious, it probably represents too great a constraint on the development process, uh, and we're not able to modify that, not able to feedback knowledge of what these things are proven to be, in order to be able to improve the interpretation process and uh, mitigation, because we're just not looking. So there's been numerous sites where there's a, there's a good, good chance, chance an anomaly could prove to be something really, really significant, really significant. But, but because it's, it's been avoided, no further work has been uh, done. done. And then those, those sites then fall through the net. net. And you know, I, I, I think, think, think of several uh, potentially really quite significant, significant sites, sites which uh, um, no, no further work has been done on, uh, uh, no further consideration. consideration. Again, the, the remedy, the, the opportunity there is, is Insisting that, that the assessment process is uh, adequate. In, in effect, what we're doing is, well, on, on, if a, on, on a terrestrial site, uh, we, we were to do geophysics and find things and then not evaluate them. That's, that's, the, you know, that's what we're doing. We're just not dealing with them. We're not finding out what they are. We're not feeding that back into the development process so, to, so that we have improved interpretation and, 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 and improved advice. We should, we should be expecting a sampling process, process as a matter of course, course to, to, to resolve what these unknowns are, or at least resolve the sample of them so that we can feed that back into the process. And I think that's, that's a really... It's, it's achievable. If it was on land, land, we wouldn't even question it, it but it, it doesn't have a memory. To better understand, understand the past, we heard a lot uh, today about extensive, extensive new data sets. sets. You know, you know, obviously, uh, a great, great strength in terms of uh, future research. research. And, and we've, we've had an investi intensive investigation of some sites, sites not too many. many. There's not, not that many sites that I can think of where there's been fairly intensive work uh, on uh, other sites of the type equivalent to what would again happen in the land, on land um, pretty, um, pretty routinely. Nonetheless, where that intensive investigation has occurred, that, 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 that's great, we're getting results from it. Um, weakness. What, what, what I, I would see is uh, basically substandard expectations of post field work. work. Uh, what, what I'm having in mind here is the post field work, work assessment, analyses, publication. We have seen so little publication coming out of the marine development and archaeology. Uh, great, great to hear about dungeon boreholes. boreholes. Yes, yes, it's a success, success but why, why is that the only one? one? You know, this, this would be a matter of course if this was terrestrial archaeology. I can, I can think, think of three or four development led publications in nearly 25 years of development of archaeology at sea. And, and yes, it's early days, in a sense. 
But those, those first examples of marine development and archaeology in the mid-90s, it was only five years after PWG 16. We're not that far behind. We shouldn't be that far behind. Why are the normal things that we would expect when the developer funds post-tech assessment analyses publication? Why does that not happen in the marine sphere? Interpretations are not being fed back to the archaeological records. We've heard that again this morning. That Yes, to some extent, data is becoming available, if you know where to look and how to find it. But the key thing is not just the data, it's the interpretation being fed back into an archaeological record. So it shows up straight away uh, on these, uh, uh, when you do a search. And again, see that time and time again. We have acquired masses of information about archaeological sites in the marine sphere. But you don't find it when you go and look on the records, because it hasn't made it as far as the records. And that's a really major failing. Data are not accessible or discoverable. Now, we heard a bit about that this morning. Arguably, it is there, it is discoverable. I think most of these examples this morning were from heritage agency funded investigations rather than development led investigations. Yeah, okay. So I thought that was the case. So, in principle, we have the mechanisms, but they're not, they're only being applied to. Um, yeah, yeah, heritage, heritage agency, agency work, work, not to development network work. work. There are, there are some, some, but it's, yeah, yeah but, but, but not perhaps, perhaps in the quantity compared to the amount of development network that has occurred. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to contradict, contradict what Peter's saying, saying, but I'm just sort of qualifying that uh, to some, some extent. extent. And, and, and again, lack of synthesis. synthesis. This is what we really need. This is the way to be able to take all that data, make sense of it, to feed it back into the development process through synthesis. And this is something that's been recognised on land, but not uh, really recognised in the marine sphere. So, what are the threats? Um, consenting is undermined by evidence that is AWOL. You know, that evidence has been acquired. But it's, it's not, 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 you can't get it. It's not in a way there, whether it's going to inform the, uh, the, the curators, it's not there to inform the uh, contractors, it's not there to inform the, effect, the developers. So we're, this is where we come back to a hamster wheel. It's a hamster wheel with a goldfish mind. It's as if we're running around without forgetting what happened on the last revolution. So um, that's, that's not good for the consenting process. And I think the overall legitimacy of archaeology in the development process is undermined by the lack of benefit to knowledge. If we can't demonstrate why development-led archaeology is beneficial to the public through the developer, then the argument for not bothering becomes harder to deal with. We've got to bear in mind that there is pressure. There will be pressure on environmental standards, on environmental expectations, particularly if we go our own way as to, well, what's the benefit? And then unless we can point to a benefit for why it's really advantageous to the public in terms of new, new information, uh, to, if it's advantageous in terms of understanding the past, um, the, the pressure will be there, well, let's just remove archaeological heritage from the requirements of the EIA. It doesn't actually do anything, it doesn't actually generate any benefit, it just generates a cost. So unless we can demonstrate benefit in that broader political uh, Climate, uh, where uh, that, that is very definitely a threat. So, yeah, opportunities. All of this is provided for on paper. We have good policies. Uh, we have a, a strong consenting process. This could happen. It could be done uh, in the right way. Um, it, it's within our uh, our capabilities. It's not as if we're in a system that isn't uh, isn't uh, properly put together. Um, I think the historically the research framework and agenda, the way that it recognises the need to spread uh, research, to engage uh, across sectors and to um, stimulate synthesis uh, in the marine develop in a development-led sphere on land is, is absolutely the right message. But we have to make sure that that message carries over into the marine sphere also. So what I, you know, what I very much hope to see is uh, you know, some synthesis work happening in marine environments to draw all this information together, whether it's in submerged landscapes or it's uh, on, uh, on, on, on wrecks or whatever the various uh, uh, themes it might be on. Um, 
and I'm very, very much looking forward to the implementation of the of HIAS, which I think, uh, in its new form, as I understand it, will help enormously with being able to uh, make development and that data available. I mean, one of the problems with the inf existing infrastructure is it's just simply not capable of dealing terribly well with the kinds of data that development and data archaeology generates in, in, in the environment. So hopefully when the new system comes out, it will be much more capable of dealing with that. We'll have uh, event recording, we'll have some of the fantastic jitters that comes out, we'll be able to attach that into records. We might be able to better cope better with uh, extensive uh, um, assets uh, rather than points and small features and so on. So I think high assets is critical from my point of view as to making the development of archaeology work better. Public engagement. So obviously we get some another examples of accessible publications being framed uh, really at, at the, 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 um, the, the general public. There's local engagement quite often with like talks to local societies in connection with specific developments, that kind of thing that happens. Um, media interest around some specific developments uh, sometimes is, is, is good. Um, and there's some lobbying interest. I've seen that what's happening with Goodwins is really interesting. Probably a bit of a pain for some people, but it's also very interesting to see the public taking a view on the marine development and, and engaging with the development process. Um, that's not something that we've seen very often. It's something that we see much more in, in, on land uh, than uh, in the marine sphere. So weaknesses, sorry, weaknesses. In the general public, I don't think we have much of a constituency in the planning and consenting process. So we don't see people engaging the general public engaging with schemes uh, like uh, major ports, aggregate proposals, wind farm proposals, from the point of view of heritage. Now they do certainly on other themes, um, landscape, uh, birds, uh, cetaceans, all sorts of things. There is a, uh, you see, uh, there is a constituency which the environmental NGOs uh, work with to, to make sure that the public is having a say when it comes to uh, whether something should happen in the marine sphere. Doesn't happen in, uh, for archaeology, archaeology for heritage, and I, I think that is a weakness because, well, I'll come on to it. But it's really important to the of the whole system. I would say that most of our outputs from the development and that process are inaccessible uh, to to a general public. Um, technically, they're accessible, but they mostly come out as fairly technical reports, which can, as Claire was saying, can be a bit of difficult for a specialist to find what they want, never mind uh, uh, in a lay person to find, uh, find out uh, what they might want. And broadly, very limited participation, uh, you know, if you like at a, um, again, community level or whatever. Level. Um, this marine development-led archaeology is about a few archaeologists, a few developers uh, talking to each other, going pirouetting around the little circles which is largely out with um, the interest of the general public, and there's not many opportunities for the general public to get involved in that. Um, so the threats, as I say, the place of archaeology and development like process is undermined, I think, in, uh, in specific applications, uh, but also uh, in the overall rationale uh, for why it is that developers have to jump through hoops. If, there's no, if you can't see the public benefit, then why should the developer jump? And they will say that to their political representatives uh, and so on. That, and that, I think, undermines the whole system. And I think curatorial, curatorial resourcing decisions are undermined by lack of public benefit. So decisions being made in organisations about well, how, many, how, much, how many people should we, we have? We've got limited budgets. Uh, how, how, how many people should there be uh, involved in the curatorial side in marine archaeology, in marine development in archaeology? Well, if you can't see the public benefit, then, well, why put, you know, if we're going to get more public benefit from land-based planning, that's the sensible place uh, to put your archaeological resources. So unless we solve the public benefit, I think we will always have uh, too few people uh, in the place that matter. The opportunities, I think this was said already, it is 
generally speaking, in the, in the developer's interest to increase the public benefit arising out of their work. So they pay a fortune, in a sense, for technical reports, uh, for very little additional money, they could get some great public outreach material. Um, so I think it's, it is in their interest. Some of them recognise that, and, and they do uh, fund uh, kind of more outreachy type things, but um, I don't, uh, you know, it is broadly in their interest. That is an opportunity for us to work on. Um, in consenting, public benefit is, is strongly supported in, in the marine policy statement, and that's what uh, Pip was saying earlier. You know, there is a very strong case. It's not. It's not. This isn't extra. This is. It's, it's not a nice little extra in the interest of the developer. This is fundamental in planning policy that there should be identifiable public benefit. Um, let, 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 let's, let's work on it. We, we have, a, in effect, a fairly strong consenting capability there. Uh, and obviously, the technology and communications uh, that have, uh, those revolutions that have been occurring in, in all our lives over the last 10 or 15 years are really good for marine archaeology one way or another because they, they give you the capability to be able to make what's out there and has for so long seemed invisible uh, so much more visible to the general public, to a, to a lay audience. And, and so that's a tremendous, uh, whether you're knocking it out on Twitter, it's the kind of thing we're doing with multi-being, the way in which we're able to use colour in the, uh, uh, the um, colour printing. I was talking to someone about, who I knew from 20 years ago, about a publication we did on the same estuaries when we did it. It was all in black and white, hand-drawn, with little dots on letter set, and so on. And that's, in a sense, not that long ago. You know, that publication would be so much better if we did it now. Uh, because of well, what we can do uh, in terms of presenting uh, information. Never mind that the information that we have is so much better too. So that's a, a huge opportunity to, to, to make use of. That's, those, that, those three little reviews there are, are looking at marine archaeology in a sense, to, to, to some extent in, in, in isolation. What I wanted to come to now was a uh, one of the things that was much vaunted in, say, the early mid-90s was this idea of seamlessness uh, in between marine archaeology and terrestrial archaeology. It was a big driver in some of the work that was going on. I'm thinking, for, for example, um, work that went on in Langston Harbour, which I think was Historic England funded work. A whole group of people, uh, institutions involved in the idea that you could look at a landscape, some of which was wet, some of which was dry, but look at it uh, as a whole. So, and in many respects, uh, seamlessness has been achieved in many ways. So in terms of methodologies, we can do as good a stuff in, uh, in the marine sphere as we can on land in many respects. Sometimes uh, we have certain advantages even uh, in terms of acquiring large, large amounts of data. Legislation and policy in the marine development sphere, leaving aside policy and legislation to do with designation, which is a whole other issue but in terms of planning law and policy we have in effect seamlessness uh, we have as good legislation and policy in the marine sphere for development of archaeology as we do on the terrestrial side we've got the marine coastal access act we've got the, uh, the various acts driving uh, uh, major infrastructure we've got the uk marine policy statement which has got a very firm and clear statement uh, about uh, dealing with uh, marine dealing with the historic environment. So that's, you know, that's a you know, good seamlessness there. Seamless employment. Uh, we heard about quite a few organisations there, most of which are terrestrial and marine. We've got elements of both. You know, so if you like, in employment terms, marine archaeologists are employed in exactly the same way and often in the same organisations as uh, in, uh, in land archaeology, development and archaeology and land. So there's, there's quite, that's quite a lot of seamlessness. Assessment methodologies, again, I think that's all very straightforward now. Um, it might not have been 10, 15 years ago, but you know, the question, how do you assess the impacts of a major aggregate proposal or report uh, on the marine, historic environment? Well, that's not a problem. We know how to do that. Um, the public engagement, not quite as seamless for, for some of the points I was just making now, but um, to some extent, uh, there is, I think, in the public more generally, uh, partly because of what we're able to provide technologically, but uh, there is a, um, 
a broader awareness of the historic environment offshore. You don't always have to start off at first principles. Uh, so I think that there is a degree of seamlessness there. Um, Something that I'm not sure about though, resourcing, certainly in the curatorial side, we don't have seamlessness of resourcing, I don't think. Um, the interpretation, looking at um, how these things all fit together, that's not seamless by any means. We still, I mean, we heard a little bit about it in a sense this morning, having research frameworks which are for the marine sphere, but not necessarily articulated with the land sphere. You know, that we tend to see them as being separate things. Uh, we interpret military heritage, uh, maritime heritage on land without referencing the shipwrecks, which are the physical manifestation of it. That happens all the time. We do ha we have very little in the way of what I would call seamless joined up in, uh, interpretation. Uh, enhancement. So in the, the NPPF, the, 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 the chapter heading is uh, conservation and enhancement of the historic environment. I don't think we've even started to talk about enhancement in the marine sphere as being a part of what we should be doing uh, in, in how we deal with development and archaeology at sea. And, I, and, I, and my feeling is, because of what I was saying about publication post-ex, what we expected of the developer uh, is not, not the same, same uh, at sea uh, as, as on land. land. Otherwise, we'd, we'd have a whole stream of publications and post-ex analyses and, and, so and so on having been carried out. out. And even, even when, when those have been carried out, out it's, it's not always been at the developer's cost. cost. It's, it's quite, quite often been the public purse picking up uh, to, uh, to step, step in because the, uh, the developer wasn't pinned down. down. So, so um, another, another more broad one, so my daughter is an absolutely keen uh, Hamilton, Hamilton fan, fan. So, so I'm always hearing about the room where it happens, um, and, and being, being in the room where it happens. If you, if you don't, don't know about Hamilton, Hamilton that, that means nothing, nothing but I get it drilled into me, or something to me a lot. So the room where it happens, marine archaeology is not in the room where it happens a lot of the time. So archaeology on the land has been under huge pressures, you know what those pressures are. And, and has had a lot to cope with. And, and we've marine has largely fallen off the bottom of that very long agenda, agenda too often. And I think that's, that's a great shame. shame. Um, so so uh, without, without wanting to be too specific, specific but I need to provide some examples. Um, 21st century challenges. challenges. Some really important challenges which were really relevant to the marine sphere. They apply equally to the marine sphere. Marine sphere. But the marine side, side didn't really, really feature in those discussions, and that was a really weak. I mean, that's, that's probably the marine sector's fault, fault. But, but one way, way or another, marine wasn't in the room, room when some really key challenges, challenges about archaeology as a whole, including development of archaeology uh, uh, in the marine sphere, were, 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 were being discussed. And that, that their relevance, uh, their, their application uh, in, in, in the marine sphere was just missed out. I think that's a great shame. shame. Um, uh, yeah, again, the one or two critical books, documents like uh, GPA 2, Managing Significance and Decision Taking Historical Great, great document. document. I love it. Beautifully clear. But it says it only refers to land planning. If that had said, this process applies to national infrastructure and marine planning, as well as land planning, that would be a perfect document from my point of view. But, and that would have taken how much ink? You know? It's really frustrating when you see documentation coming out, which is, is relevant to the historic environment, whatever environment it's in, uh, and, it, and it uh, talks about the marine planning process, sorry, the planning process, rather than the planning processes. And I think that's a, that's a shame. So in those cases, marine archaeology is not in marine, and that's a, uh, in those discussions, and that's a big issue. Another thing about the room, the room where it happens, um, so, so uh, heritage, heritage counts, heritage, heritage indicators, 2018, so 798 full-time equivalent historic environment staff, including 265 full-time uh, equivalent archaeologists uh, in, in, in local authorities. Um, and and, and, and the, the, the big news about that is still, so those numbers are increasing now, but it's a 35% cut since 2006. How many? in marine planning authorities and their advisors. We heard three. I think we've got one seconded in Northern Ireland. 
I don't, I don't know, know how many FTEs in the historic environment Scotland would count themselves as involved in marine planning. Less than one. Less than one. In, in Wales, Wales, three products of Scotland in the part part of the general, general yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. They've, they've got, got many, many, many other things to cope with, with. And, and, and similarly in, 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 in Wales. Wales. You know, the, 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 we just, just, the numbers just, just I mean, I've included, included a map because, because that's the area for which they're responsible. responsible. The extent of the areas for which they're responsible. So we've got marine planning, planning right out to that out, out to limit. Now, fair, fair enough, most of the elements are closer in there. But these are big areas with some really critical archaeology in them. And we just do not have the staff uh, in the... Uh, and that, and that, that doesn't have to be in the historic environment agencies. That's in, like, the MMO have got no marine staff. You know, the Marine Scotland has no marine staff. Uh, sorry, no historic environment. Just no. You know, so they're not just looking at the curatorial authorities. Broadly, there is not people with a historic environment background who are able, uh, in, 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 in a lot of the numbers. I mean, we talk, we talk about three in, in historic England, England, but that's, that's not even covering just marine licensing. licensing. That's, that's also covering all the aspects of policy, policy development too. Uh, and, and then you know, it'll be true of an awful lot of work being happening uh, in uh, developing marine plan policies, uh, which is coming from the same team. team. So they're, they're very stretched very thin. Um, another indicator. So four hundred and twenty-six thousand planning applications. So this is an indicator uh, uh, in uh, in heritage accounts for, for England. Um, marine marine consent is not even an indicator. So how on earth do we know? What the size of the problem is, if we're not even, we don't even have an indicator on how we are looking after uh, the historic environment uh, uh, in, in marine development. So, you know, that's really, you know, how, 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 it's not, we don't even have a guide to action. So that's how far, not, not in the room, not even on the corridor. Uh, right, some conclusions I haven't whittled on for too long. Um, Conclusion, real, real dividend or, or an invisible legacy. legacy. Um, so, so things, things I, would, I, would I would like to see, a, some kind of independent review of the operation of the uh, development management system uh, in the marine sphere. It's, it's been going at probably 25 years. I think that's about time to have a look at it, collect some data and see, does this work? Is it fit for purpose? Does it do what it should be doing? Uh, as you can tell, I don't think it is reaching all its potential. I think, I think just a reminder that there's been a lot of emphasis and some really positive work done on heritage planning recently, and I think that's fantastic. But we should remember that not planning law is also law. Non-compliance with planning law is also heritage crime. So let's look at compliance, let's look at enforcement. When a developer is expected to do something, required to do something by the terms of their consent, then let's make them do it. If they don't, they're not meeting their consent. We should be treating it in the same way as we worry about metal detectors, you know, the night hawks, uh, and, uh, and uh, amateur divers pulling chunks off. You know, they're not going to be that, you know, we've got to take the same uh, approach to developers when they're not doing what they say, uh, what they're obliged to do. Um, my own feeling is that we should be supporting land-based curators in marine planning, not necessarily looking just to have marine planning type people. I think the massive experience that there is amongst terrestrial curators is really valuable in the marine sphere. The fact that it's at sea doesn't really make much difference to the kinds of decisions where curatorial input is required. And I think there's a perhaps a tendency for land curators, land-based curators, partly because they've got far too much on their plates anyway, but to say, well, Marines, it's too different. And it, and it really isn't. Most of the issues are uh, similar. Uh, land-based experience is, is equally uh, valid and, in many respects, more valid. Um, and, and, and also, also I, I think uh, that's in the local planning authorities too. Uh, I think we need to look a little bit more about the role of the local planning authorities. Again, probably not going to be that keen because they've got too much on too. But uh, uh, I think the role of IFCA's, the Inshore Fisheries Conservation Authorities, is interesting. Those are local planning, sorry, local authority bodies. They have responsibilities towards conservation. 
that encompass the, the historic environment. And we should be looking at that in terms of HDR provision, ensuring that those elements of local authorities have uh, can, uh, in, a, in a sense, enabled to start taking the role of, in perhaps in some aspects relating to green planning also a development of archaeology too. Support for a regional uh, marine heritage forum. So the NEMAC, which is not the Smith and Archaeology Forum, I think is a great uh, organisation. It's a way of them talking to each other across various sectors. Um, but I think, as far as I know, that's the only one uh, in the country. Uh, and I think that would be something to see would, would, would really help in, in sharing experience, uh, resolving some of these issues about synthesis and knowledge uh, and, and, and availability of data and, and, uh, and so on. And, and building public, public constituency, that's something that we think I think is really critical. We have to find ways of sharing development, that green development archaeology with the public in a way so that they can engage and participate and actually see what the value is uh, to them, to society as a whole. Because otherwise, as I say, the um, you know, the, 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 the very presence of archaeology as a development they concern in the marine environment could do it away uh, or, or be simply struck off the list. So that's plenty of me going on. Questions, thoughts, discussion? Thank you.